Good afternoon. Um, just before starting the presentation, let me uh, introduce myself to you. I am Tug, or Tug Dual, Tug Dual Coral. I am technical evangelist at MAPAR. MAPAR is building a, a complete big data platform using Hadoop, Spark, Kafka, distributed file system on database. And um, before working at MAPAR, I work in multiple companies, most, mostly always software companies, so MongoDB, Couchbase, with the same type of role where I am helping people to adopt uh, the, te the technology. And the goal of today's presentation is to kind of talk about anomaly detection and use this using an example based in a telco using a very simple, simple on a application. Everything uh, is available as an open source project, just if you want to play with the technology. And this talk is not about deep dive into machine learning and all this. I am not a data scientist first, so I'm not building uh, and working only with the data. What I am doing most of the time is helping people to build applications to choose what will be the good architecture to build such application where as part of the thing you have to do, it's to plug machine learning techniques to do anomaly detection, for example. But you will see that you have different uh, steps uh, when you do that. So when we talk about anomaly detection, first is who needs uh, this? And you have many types of companies. Telcos is one example, but everybody, every time you will have an, uh, an application, for example, utility provider, electricity, gas, and so on, they want to be able to capture data using sensors and get information back to their IT to be able to take some decision. If they see uh, a pressure going down, this is an anomaly. They have to be alerted as fast as possible. And in many, many cases, when we are talking about anomaly detection, we want to deal that in real time. And you will see the challenge is between capturing a lot of data and dealing with data in real time. <coughs> Same when you are working on a, in, inside a factory. You want to capture the, the anomaly directly when you are building the, the chip, when you are building your car, and so on. For example, in this specific use case, we have a project with a, a chip manufacturer uh, in the US where they capture all the vibration they have on the factory lane just to be sure they don't have too much vibration because vibration will create defect into the chips. So they capture that in real time, all the time, all the time, comparing with the data, then sending some alerts. And this is what we will use in telcos. In telcos, it's the data traffic, how the people are connected to the 3G network and LTE and so on. And if you look yourself as a user of a mobile, what you want to be sure that you are paying for a specific plan, you want to be sure that it's a good quality. So your telco operator has to be sure that the quality of service you are paying for is there. Because every time you will have a defect, you as a customer, you will have, they will have a risk to see you going to the competitor. So by analyzing in real time what's happening on the network, what's happening in different calls you have from, from the mobiles to the network, the company in telcos will be able to have a better quality of service for their customer. And what we have to keep in mind again is the volume of data. It will be millions of messages every second going on the network and millions of messages you have to analyze, you have to deal, you have to process and compare to the rest of the data to detect an anomaly. So when we talk about anomaly detection, it's to discover what's an anomaly, what's a rare event, something that is not, uh, should not be here. So from a business point of view, from an IT point of view, you want to do that before your customer realize that you have, a mis you have an anomaly inside your network. You want to do that before your CEO realizes that you have an, an issue in your application. But the biggest challenge is we don't know what, is anom uh, what an anomaly is. We don't know how to find an anomaly. In reality, 
everything will be based on data. If we look at this, this is a set of data. It could be anything. It could be a number of calls. It could be heart rate monitor. It could be a number of RPM in a car or in an engine. We don't care. But when you will see something like that, you may find that, oh, this is an anomaly. So the goal of all the uh, anomaly detection, and we will see which techniques we can use, is first to understand what is normal. And this is the most important part. To be able to define an anomaly, you need first, or find an anomaly, you need first to define what's the normal behavior of your application. So a big part of your data, a big part of your work of the application will be to capture data. And you capture as much data as possible to be able to build a model, to be able to understand what will be the standard behavior, what will be the normal data set for your application. And then you will use machine learning techniques, so you have many libraries, you have many, it's mostly mathematics and statistics, to be able to uh, b build this model and determine what is normal, and then compare this specific model to, wha to see what's, it, what's an anomaly. And when you will do anomaly detection model, what you do is you have this model that this is what is normal. And as a data, this is a model you build based on existing data. And as the data come inside your system, you will compare this model to the data coming in. And automatically, you will say, this is correct, this is correct, this is an anomaly. And for this, you have different algorithms, you have different libraries. But very often, when we do complex things, we, we will use clustering of the data. Clustering of the data is to take a big set of data and isolate them in single cluster or multiple cluster. Typically, here we see we have five clusters of data, depending on how the data has been looked, how the data has been organized. And when you look inside your model, you will say, if I have a dot here, it's probably an anomaly, because you will compare with these different things. So all the algorithm, all the data you will be working on, it's to build that. This is typically the job of the infamous data scientist inside your company, to be able to find how do you organize this data, to build the model. And you as a developer, at least myself, I consider myself as an application developer, it's to use the model to compare the data coming inside the system to this. And you, it's, sometimes it's very easy. You just have to define what will be the alert. If the dot line, the dark line, kind of at the one, it's the average of all the data, you can put simple thre threshold to say, OK, all the x are simple issues. They are anomalies. So gray data will be everything that is normal inside your system, but the x will be the anomalies. So in this case, you just had to put some threshold for this very simple use case about anomaly detection. This is one single way of doing it. So you will just create a threshold. But sometimes it's more complex. If we look at another data set, you may want to evolve this using a percentile, uh, uh, a centile, a percentile of the data. So you calculate on the normal behavior what will be the percentiles. And everything that is, could be outside this could be considered as an anomaly. Simple statistics mechanics uh, algorithm. But sometimes when you have spikes, you will see that this could change. And inside your application, you have to choose, is it part of the model or not? Because sometimes you may have some exceptions using this way. But the algorithm that you will be using is just, every time you get the data, you compare with the summary of the data, what will be the threshold, uh, plus or minus, and you will compare. If it's outside this, you raise an exception, you raise an alert. And what I want to show you, it's not necessarily how to build this, it's to build how do you capture the data, how do you generate the alarm. So if we look at it from a pure project, how do you deal with the data? What is normal? 
what do you have to measure to find anomalies, and what will be out of the, out of the normal to be sure that you get the information, and how far do you have to go to consider that it's an anomaly? Because in many cases, it's not because you have a pike that is a big issue. Sometimes it's because you have five or ten pikes in five seconds that will become an issue. So you have all this data to calculate. So creating a normal model is very easy. Finding the issue will depend on the algorithm. If you want to do very complex things, you will use more advanced libraries, more advanced algorithms. You can find a free book. Uh, uh, on Mapper website, explaining different approach. Uh, you will have access to the PowerPoint after to find all the links. But for me, the challenge was not how do you build this model when you create the application, because most of the time you will work with a data scientist that is used to deal with this data. You will have to explain sometimes to him what are the data, what are the structure of the data, how it's organized, but how do you build the full application to capture the data, store the data, process, and so on. So this is where I took this example using telcos. If you look at the telcos, is on a network you have multiple antennas, 3G antennas, 4G antennas that you have. All this is connected to the main data center or to the main application of your uh, telco operator. So you will send data all the time about the number of calls, the status of the antenna, and so on and so on. Then people will be able to get some alerts based on what you build inside this application. And this is typically building this that uh, I want you to at least understand how it's done or how it could be done. And you will have all the user, all the device, all the mobile phone connected to antenna, sending messages, so doing CDR, call data record, and uh, get information back to the IT. And when you build this application, or when you build the network, what you see is the device to the antenna will send data. Then from the antenna, you will send information about the application itself, the type of data, the type of session, is it vi it's a voice over IP, is it an internet connection, it's a video, whatever you want to capture. But from the application point of view, you have to store the data to be able to keep record of it for analytics or any reason, but also you want to use that to process the data to detect anomalies. So if we look at where do we play as a developer, as an architect, as a software? The first part from the device to the antenna, most of the time we don't deal with that. It's purely network. It doesn't have to do anything with what, uh, what we deal with usually. And it's the same, you can replace the device as a phone to any IoT kind of application. It will find a way to send you information in real time to a specific network. Then, depending on how the network is done, but what you want is you want to be able to have the antenna to stream the data into your system in real time. You don't want to process too much on the, uh, close to the device because you want to have the raw data as fast as possible into the system. This is how you will be able to detect anomalies. And then, when you want to store the data, you have many options. But if you want to keep everything, for example, I was working with a UK company where they generate, for this kind of information, three terabytes every day. Three terabytes of data coming inside the system every day. So if you want to keep everything, today it's possible. All the big data platforms, distributed file system, distributed database, you can do it. Uh, it's very easy. Then, if you want to analyze and process, you need a, a distributed processing layer that gives you not only the capabilities of distribution of the process, but be able to use this to do, for example, machine, le uh, machine learning. And I will, if you are not familiar yet with this technology, network, then from the antenna, for example, we can use either IoT protocol like, like MQTT, but also Apache Kafka, or any other streaming technology. Mapper Streams, it's exactly like Kafka. Different implementation on the network, same impl implementation for the developers. 
and I will come in a minute to all these components. So then you send the message from the antenna to the IT, and you will use Spark on Spark Streaming to process the information. This is where you do all the analytics. This is where you do all the anomaly detection based on the rules developed and defined by the data scientist. And you store the information in a NoSQL database or in a distributed file system. Why this? Just because of the volume. If you have millions of messages every second coming in a relational database, transactional database, it will be complex to scale. Just compare with a NoSQL database or a distributed file system. So Spark is a very interesting technology when we talk about distributed, distributed computing, distributed processing. It has been built to do processing of the data with the same concept that you had in MapReduce. You all heard about Hadoop on MapReduce. That was not very efficient. It was, it's very, very, very powerful, MapReduce. The issue, it's not very fast. When we talk about anomaly detection, when we talk about fraud detection, when we talk about millions of messages per second that you want to deal with and immediately react, you need something that is faster. Spark is using memory most of the time to process the information, and it provides some very interesting libraries. So in this case, in this demonstration, what we will use, we will core, just the processing of the data, and you can deploy Spark on many, many, many machines. You will use different libraries at the top of it, Spark SQL, we won't use it in this demonstration. Spark Streaming, this is how you will capture the information. Machine Learning, this is how you add business logic to process the data based on models and graphics. It's when you have data graph, you can manipulate that using Manipulem them using Spark. You don't need to have a graph database. Spark doesn't store any data. It access any data store put data in memory, distribute everything, and do the processing. And when I say it's running in memory and it's distributed, you all know Netflix. Netflix is using Spark to do the recommendation and the prediction for the movies. They have a 100 terabyte, uh, they have 100 terabyte of RAM, of memory, to deal with Spark. They, kind of, they have one, I think 1,200 EC2 instances on the cloud just to run Spark, to make it as fast as possible. And the way Spark is working is it will access the data that could be a file, could be a database. In my case, I will mostly use a database plus a stream, and it will create the RDD, the in-memory representation of the data, and it will distribute that in many nodes, when you have multiple nodes, and it will do all the work about aggregation and transformation on each of the nodes and communicate between the nodes depending on what he has to do. When you have to do a count, obviously he has to count here, here, and here, then returns the total of information. When you have to do a join between data, you may have to, mod to move the data around between different nodes. But an important part is the resilient data set and the fact that it's based on Scala. Internally, Spark is used on Scala. On an important concept about Scala on many functional language, you cannot modify data. A variable is not a variable, it's immutable. RDD, you cannot modify it. So every time you will do something with the data, when you do a transformation, if you want to filter, if you want to create a key value from it, it will create a copy of the RDD. So you have a first RDD that will be the raw data. You do some manipulation. This manipulation could be any mathematical, it could be any machine learning techniques. And it will return you another RDD on which you can do some actions like counting, for example. So it's very efficient. This is immutable to guarantee that if you have one node dying and if you want to modify, multi uh, do some multiple computation, the data that you have originally are not modified, so it's very efficient. And you have many uh, transformations. 
So if you want to create map, map to pair, group by, reduce, and so on, this is a concept that you have in MapReduce re made on RDDs. And you have some operation, like for example, count, first, take. This one is, uh, you can for each of the entry inside your memory structure, execute a function. This is something we use a lot to manipulate and aggregate some information. Save as text, save as database, because all this, you are manipulating different RDDs from one step to another, to another, to another. Very often at the end, you want to do something with the data. Either you save the result back into the file system or the database, or you can send an alert to the system, and this is what we do in, in the demonstration. So here is just the processing of the data. Spark will be here to process the data. The next important part is how do we get the data inside the system? To get the data inside the system in this application, we want to stream the data directly from the data source into the processing layer. And for this, Kafka, Mapper Streams, will push the data into Spark Streaming. So who knows about Apache Kafka? So yeah, it's a very, one of the very, very common uh, layers that we have. It's a very, the adoption of this technology is very fast. So Apache Kafka, it's a publish subscribe kind of approach where you send message in topics, so you organize data in different topics. You push it from a producer into one, or, uh, one topic, and you have multiple consumers reading the data. And Kafka is just an open source project that has been built to make it very easy to scale, very easy to deploy, and very simple to, uh, to develop with. A lot more simple than, for example, a GMS. I'm coming from Java, Java EE, from, from Java Messaging Services. It doesn't do everything that GMS is doing, but it does everything you need for most of the application. Very easy to use and a very nice way to get the data using streams. And to scale, you can create multiple producers publishing, for example, in one topic. And if you want to have a large scalability, if you have millions of messages to read or hundreds of thousands of messages to read or published, you will partition. Kafka will let you partition the data into different, uh, in the same topic, but into different nodes. And same, you will create multiple consumers that are part of the same group if you want to read the same data, but in parallel in multiple groups. So if we look at how it's done, you will have multiple producers pushing data in one or multiple topics in different brokers, so in different servers, physical servers, or partitions, and you will have consumer. So in this case, this is how you will be able to scale if you have, for example, all the session ID, all the caller's ID from your mobile application or from your mobile network into the system. Kafka has been built by LinkedIn, and LinkedIn uses that to capture all the log of their application on, on their uh, application server and application to aggregate and modify and move data around inside their system. So it has been built to scale and to do it easily, I will say. The difference between MapperStream and Kafka is just what do you have in the middle? The broker is just different. Uh, inside uh, Mapper, we try to have a very single way of dealing with all data that you store. The files, the database, and the message are stored in the same place, in Mapper file system, and distributed file system, and database, where Kafka has his own system to store the data. But when you get the data in, so you have your application, your uh, caller, your phone, calling on a specific antenna, starting a session, opening the session, say, I want to call this specific number. You will send a message to this. It will initiate some information inside a consumer. This consumer in the application is based on Spark. But you could be use any technology, Java, Scala, and C, depending on how you want to develop, to consume this message. But the benefits of Spark streaming is you will have all the power of what I described about the distributed processing of the data, 
but data will come directly from Kafka live. So in this case, what's happening is every time you push messages from the producer to Kafka, and the consumer will read the data, the way Spark is working is doing what we call micro-batching. You will read the data for a few seconds, deal with the data, process the data, then read the data for a few seconds. This is what you call about, you can see micro-batching. It's working for most of the application. You don't need real streaming all the time because inside Spark, streaming, you can have windowing functions that will do aggregation and calculation between two batches. So Kafka to, to send the data, Kafka to consume the data, Spark streaming to process or to send the data into your processing layer. So what I have done here is I build an application, still an ongoing effort, but I build an application available on GitHub, if my internet connection is correct. This application is the representation of the first schema here, where you will have the different layer of a simulator that creates a network, users and antenna, then pushing the message into the processing layer. So for this, what I have done is, but what we have done, because we are, is first, everything is in Java. I choose to, to, to not use too much Scala to make it easier to read. Most of the time, if you, if you become I want to become a Spark expert, I will push you, uh, invite you to learn Scala. So this is a web, just a web UI. The web UI will give you this application that allow me to see what's going on on my network. The second application is a Spark application. This Spark application takes, it's a consumer of Kafka, consume the messages, save them into the database, doing some aggregation. So I'm starting the Spark process. The other one will do some more aggregations and do the anomaly detection. In this case, I will come back to the anom anomaly detection, what it's doing really, when I have started everything. So what we should see now is, this is a Spark console, and you see you don't have any message coming inside the system. This is just the technical side of uh, Spark. So now what I will start is I will run my universe. I will run my simulator of network. This simulator of network will create six antenna, and will create 100 devices, 100 users that will create calls and all this stuff. So let's start the application. And if we look when it's running, the universe is just an ACA application with specific actors. Okay. Internet is not helping me. So I will let the, so this is the antenna with the coverage of the antenna. And we should see soon messaging. Here we go. We will see, so each dot is kind of a user with a call, and will randomly create a, a user with a phone. They will move around, and they will send call to the system. They will try to create a call. Each time you have a tentative, if this user, you see the line, this user is connected to this antenna doing a call. So in real time, what we capture, we capture the data, and we see some information about the different sessions coming inside the system. And we come back to the, uh, to the status of the antenna. So how does it work? Is 
In this application, you are, we use Kafka to simulate the user on the calls to the antenna. But what is important, it's more what's happening once the antenna receives a call and send the information to the database, or to, to Kafka, sorry. So, to get the information, it's quite easy. Inside Kafka, you create a producer, you get the message, and you send it. So when I do the producer send, is changing, is sending a message about a call, a specific JSON. In this case, I use JSON, a JSON message saying, I am this user, I'm sending this uh, uh, session ID, and a specific process when you do a call, it's a different set of messages, and I will use SQL to show you, well, you use SQL. This is a SQL statement into my database, it's an OSQL database, that say, give me in the list of CDR, a specific session. A specific session is when you do a call, you open a call to the telco, to the antenna, you try to do a call. The antenna will say, yes, it's open, or no, retry, retry, then I am connected. And I am connected, and I can move from one antenna to another antenna. And then, I, either the antenna drops the call, or I close the call. If we look, at this specific session, I had tried to connect to the antenna number four. I had a fail, tried to connect to the antenna number one, then it, re uh, uh, it was successful, and I do all the sessions. So this is when it's moving around, it's communicating all the time with the user. All these interactions are made using a specific uh, ACA and actor models where you have inside the models you will have antenna, a tower on antenna, but more importantly you will have colors and messages. And the ACA model is just to simu uh, create a simulator. Inside this simulator you will have different rules to say every every 25% of the call will fail on the antenna, one of the antenna will die after a specific moment of time, just to capture this as an anomaly. So if we look at this, sometimes we will see some antenna becoming orange or black, meaning they cannot receive call anymore. This is just a simulator. So for example, this one was down and up, too many calls were failing, so it was orange. This one has been, the number two is just dead. Inside the simulator, we said, kill this. Because for the anomaly detection, to move from green to yellow to black is how many calls are failing based on the statistic you had in the past. Usually, on a specific antenna, you will have 10 calls a minute. And if you start to move to one call a minute, you probably have, a feel, uh, you have a f something wrong. It's an anomaly. Or you, if you do zero call a minute or no message from the tower, it's another anomaly. And this is typically what we calculate here. You see the different antenna. It's kind of dark, and we'll try to zoom. Where the number of failures, the number of calls per second, and so on, if this number is going down, it's probably an anomaly based on the model we have developed. It's not, so how does it work internally is to do some aggregation and to do some calculation with Spark, we get the data out of the database where we do some calculation because we store all the messages and you will do some aggregations to calculate the statistics, the number of, uh, for example, the no number of calls per second using all the features from Spark. We use Spark in real time. They are, the process are running all the time. So you see they are running. So this is a simulator that will run for, I think, 30 minutes. This process are permanent process. They are waiting for events. If we look here into Spark, this is the number of messages you receive all the time on uh, the, the different uh, 
the different consumer you have. One is the CDR, the other one is to calculate the stats. So all these uh, applications, so same if we want, how does it work when we capture an exception? When you have an alert because you see an anomaly, the number of calls that is, has been too low, more than the model itself, because the model you will build it with your data scientist, is Kafka, you can call Kafka directly from Spark. So in one case, we generate data, we send the data on Spark, uh, sorry, on Kafka. Spark is used to deal with the data, save the data in the database, analyze the data in real time. But sometimes it found a specific exception. And here, if we find an exception, we will directly get from Spark, the Kafka producer, and send the message to say, for example, this tower has failed. So what is important here is the whole ecosystem is integrated. So you have messaging technology to put, get the message, and you have messaging to push the message back into your application. And using Kafka, it's totally decoupled. You send the message on this specific fail tower stream, so the fail tower topic, anybody can consume it. In this case, who is consuming this application? This is my web application to show this information. And what I do, I consume the information directly from Kafka, from Mapper Streams, and I use WebSocket to push the information to the browser. So the most important part today, when you want to do anomaly detection and you have a large volume of data, you have to build a streaming-based architecture. Look at Kafka. Look at Mapper Streams. Look at the, uh, all these technologies that allow you to push a message at a large number of messages per second. And it's easy to scale. You have to store the data in a scalable data store. In this case, I'm using MapperDB JSON, but it could be any Hadoop storage, it could be any NoSQL database that has been built to scale. Use Spark on Spark Streaming to capture the data. And run also analytic jobs to do some really advanced analytics. For example, what is interesting about the whole Hadoop ecosystem, the whole Mapper ecosystem, is if I want to do some statistics, we all probably all know how to write a SQL statement. Who knows how to write SQL? Who knows how to write Spark? So you see you have, what, 2% of, 2%, just uh, my stats, <laughs> of people that know how to write Spark. If, if you have the data, it's very easy to use, for example, on any database, on Apache Drill, it's one of the projects in the uh, open source Apache project for big data. You can connect to any data sources. And here, I will just give me the number of call per user. So in this case, what I do, I do, I do the distinct on session, because each session are unique. And I group by the color ID, color ID being the user. And in this case, using a language that I know, a programming or query language that I use, I can see that this specific user has made any add-on 11 session. So you can run analytics on a very large scale using technology like that. Because it's all sometimes doing anomaly detection. You don't need machine learning and you don't need advanced technique. Two queries and it's done, depending on how complex is the anomaly. So I think coming from my world, where we deal with Hadoop, big data platform, all this stuff, what we see missing on the market from many, many, many companies is they need Kafka and Spark a lot. So look at that. Kafka and Spark are quite fun to use. Uh, also, it's important to understand one NoSQL, at least one NoSQL database. And look at the NoSQL database that has been built to scale, at least for this specific use case. Some, some uh, database for Neo4j, it's a graph database. It's great, but it doesn't scale. You won't have billions of, uh, billion of information into it, because it has been built to run on a single node. Machine learning, you don't need to be a data scientist yourself. But when you will do some Spark, it's interesting to also take so, some example to understand 
how uh, you build, on how you create a model, how do you analyze. I will continue to update this demonstration to uh, add more, machine, more models into the machine learning part. Because here I'm just doing some basic tests, even without machine learning. It's just how many calls in the last minutes, in the last 30 seconds, have been done on the antenna. If this is dropping too much, I find that as an anomaly. I build another demonstration using same kind of techniques, uh, where you use Kafka streamings and Spark streamings to generate data from a racing car. Same, to show how you can generate a large volume of data and process and analyze the data in real time. And if you want to learn lots of things about big data, mapper, streams, and so on, just go to this link. There are PDF. They are not related. If you look at it, except this one a little bit that talk about mapper streams, they are very, very generic. And they are small books, 80 page, 50 page. Very interesting. If you have a, a train, take a look at it. So if you have any questions, I'm here to, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so the question is about uh, Spark being a micro-batch oriented stuff. So you read every n seconds and you, you kind of windowing. So it's not fully streaming. And it's true in some very, very, especially if you need a lot of speed. So you have to take decision in a few milliseconds. It's not the best. But I will say a few milliseconds, OK, on a small So you have alternative for that. Apache Flink is one of them. It's, uh, um, and the other one will be to, to, to directly use Aka Stream, for example. <laughs> one of the companies behind, uh, at the first floor, that is doing uh, uh, big data, they are using uh, Aka Streams, just because they could not use uh, Spark Streaming. But I will say that don't jump directly on, oh, micro-batching doesn't fit my need. You learn the technology with Spark because it has a lot of stuff, in, including streaming, graphics, machine learning, and all the stuff that others are not doing. And if you have limitation, go to Flink. We, we like Flink a lot. We have many blog posts about it. We support it on our platform. But from an adoption, Spark is really big. Other questions? Yeah? So, so it's the same, it's, yeah, it's the same, except it's, made, it's done to be distributed on scale. Because the streaming itself is not distributed, but then when you get the data in, the data will be distributed on 200 nodes, if you want, or 1,000 nodes to do the calculation. Because the Spark streaming, it's only to get the data in. Yes. So if you are familiar with uh, functional language like Scala, Java 8 streams, it's very, very easy to learn Spark. So thank you.